Welcome, everyone, to Season 3, Episode 107 of the Premier Pod. I'm your host, Yashbika, joined by my co-host, Tyler Chan. Um, before we get started, it's beautiful weather right now in Georgia. I don't know how the weather is going out for everyone else that's watching, but it is a sunny day right now. We are recording when it is dark, though, but it was a nice warm weather. Get the spirits up. However, as we jump into our first topic, it is concerning Liverpool, the Merseyside Derby, where... Uh, surprisingly, Everton beat Liverpool 2-0 at Anfield. And I think this was the first um, victory, recent victory for Everton in the Merseyside Derby in a while because Liverpool have basically dominated them since Klopp has been there. But it was another loss at Anfield. The Fortress has been tumbling down and Everton get the 2-0 win. Richarlison scored. But um, Tyler, I wanted to ask the question, um, I know you're probably going to talk about the game and probably this will lead into you talking about the game. But besides the injuries, what has been going wrong with Liverpool this season? Besides the injuries that are obvious with when you lose Van Dyke and you're all your star players pretty much all the time. I, I really think losing out on just that motivation of having the fans there has really hit Liverpool hard because I feel like that extra oomph to really win ugly has been lost. Mm -hmm. Like we've been playing. I really believe that Liverpool, despite not scoring, despite not really getting that many goals on the score sheet, a lot of the build-up play has been really good for the most part. Like I feel like we're losing beautifully is how (laughs) I describe it. And last season to win the title, we won ugly, which is like the complete opposite because even watching the games in the past like few months, like Liverpool has been losing a lot, been drawing a lot, not really getting that many wins, but a lot of the chances that has been built, it's just missing that last oper- like that last bit of sharpness, that last bit of just finishing that you usually would see from that front three of Firmino, Mane, and Salah. But it's just right now, it's just gone. I don't know really what it is. I think it's a little bit of having Klopp be kind of like emotional and a pretty hard time in his life right now. And that's he's a very big manager that kind of uses his emotion to his advantage most of the time and also bringing that emotion to help you know like gear up the crowd and then having the crowd feed onto the players to just give them like you know an extra stat boost if this is like a video game <laughs> like everyone has like these base stats and then after to get the crowd going it's just like everyone's just boosted the chemistry style but, yeah it's like an extra chemistry style basically <laughs> some extra links but without that you know 12th man without those fans i really think that's really been playing a big part because This is the first time Liverpool are defending a title and they've not been good winners. They've been really bad champions, as Roy Keane said. And I mean, they had the Champions League last season and they uh, obviously that was that they literally played the last match before pandemic shut everything down against Atletico. mm -hmm. But that was one of those round of 16. They got knocked out by Atleti last season. Exactly. So I think it's really just a calm, calm, like accumulation where it's just like, it's always been Liverpool trying to finally break that deck, that that kind of that curse that Liverpool have not won these major competitions for years. Mm-hmm. And then it finally happened. And then it's like that pufferfish and Nemo at the very end when they escape the dentist's office and they're like, now what? <laughs> Is that we, do we just keep going? It's like, yeah, yeah, we do. But this has never been in the wheelhouse of you know most of the players on that team. Never has most of those players on that team had to defend a title or and this is like their first time even winning a title at most of them. Even like our star players like Salah, you know, Mane. So this is like the first time they're experiencing that. And even the more experienced players that have been on champion teams like, you know, Milner, uh, Thiago, they haven't really they can't really be the focal point right now. Like Thiago It's a little surprising that he's not helping the team win as many games. Like he's been a very big producer of opportunities and stuff. Like he's really been, I feel like a missing piece of the puzzle in terms of unlocking opportunities for Liverpool. But at the same time, I feel like he's such a different player that it kind of changed the way Liverpool plays at a certain point. And like the pace of the game is definitely a lot different with Thiago. And I don't know if it's like a good or bad thing, but right now it's, it's, as I said, it's all looking good, but just not getting the results. And I think that's the thing. Because mm-hmm. as you said, like Everton beat Liverpool, like 2-0. Well, Liverpool's at home. Yeah. And this is the first time, I believe, since like 1999, 
And this is the first time Liverpool have lost four matches in a row That's in crazy. the top division of England since the 1920s. Mm-hmm. Which That's is crazy. Like almost a hundred, like this is like a hundred years. It's like it's historically one of the worst stints like in all of their history. Yeah. And despite that, I'm still backing Klopp. Like I still think he's the right man for the job. And I think it's just a really tough time for the entire team. Like it, just mentally. That is weird though, that there were like rumors that he was going to get the sack. I'm like, you really get a sack a guy that won a Champions League? One, got you to two Champions League in a row, lost the first one, won the second one in the consecutive season, and then brought a Premier League title. I think that was just, uh, I think that was just like people just making up stuff at that point. Like you'd be stupid to do that. Exactly. And like the whole team is built around like Klopp system. And it's been so successful for so many like stints. Like we were like, even when we didn't win the Champions League or didn't win the Premier League, we're so close like for consecutive seasons yeah. and now like after finally getting it it's like all right it's not just all wheels off the bus <laughs> it's just you know just taking the wrong turn i, I so was i think i, yeah, I was gonna say guy. that um as you mentioned with klopp i've noticed that since he's come into the premier league with liverpool after obviously after that interim season where he came in midway through just kind of you know he could only do with what he had that 2016-17 season when he bought wijnaldum and then basically wijnaldum firmino um, Mane, you know, and then a season after that when they brought Salah, and then Trent Alexander and Arnold started breaking through, and then they brought Van Dyke, and then they brought the keeper. Then Robertson started cementing his place as a left back, and then the midfield basically became their way. For a lot, I don't know, as a casual that is not a Liverpool fan, that just is a Manchester United fan that watches Liverpool, I noticed that it always felt like they kind of had that same core group of players just continuously playing. And I wonder if um, burnout has played a role into some of this where it's like, yeah, Klopp has played. And, you know, for the past couple of seasons, they've been able to play kind of the same starting 11, make some tweaks in it, and they still continue to perform. But now that they've kind of reached the mountaintop, I wonder if um, it's getting a little bit harder to motivate this, this same core group of 11, starting 11 this season now that it's been, I guess now what four, four or five seasons now that he's just been mm-hmm. running the, he's basically been running it back with the same team. I would say. Yeah, I definitely can see that. And you know, it's, it's, I would say it's been a rough time for everyone, not even in soccer, but just like everyone <coughs> in just the real world. So mm-hmm. hopefully everyone listening is doing all right. But I really think it's just like a mental toll. And just, you can really tell at certain points in the game, like, most Liverpool players are just, they're just tired. Yeah. Like they just look exhausted at certain points. It's like, we've lost games, lost leads because like they just couldn't really finish out the game. And I really do think also that, you know, we've mentioned this several times at this point now, but the injury situation in Liverpool has also not helped because it's just really shifted the way Liverpool have to play to kind of compensate because like, I've been seeing the equivalent, like, People were saying it's like, oh, Liverpool, like they they just lost a few center backs. It's like it's no big deal. But it's like, no, we've lost literally our entire center back, <laughs> like starting center back three, and then we lost our two CDMs at this point. They're just you know backing up for them, and then now those two are gone, and like we're using like Kabak, who's he's all, he's been doing all right the first couple of games, but he's a little slow. Not gonna lie, <laughs> and um, like he's basically like our seventeenth pairing at center back this season, which is insane. Yeah. <laughs> We're not even done Crazy. with the season. And it's like 17th pairing. So I really think even with Ali's son, he's having a really rough run right now too, because, you know, you kind of build a relationship with your center backs and kind of have to trust in them. And Allison clearly does not trust <laughs> his defense right now. And that's what's making him, you know, mix those occasional errors at times mm-hmm. too. Not even occasional, just like at this point, it's like once per game. Yeah. But I think it's just like a very unfortunate and coincidence, like big coincidence that all these things are happening at once. It's like for Liverpool, everything's just happening to them at once at the, at the same time. And it's just a collateral thing where because the defense can't really shore up everything, the offense might not be clicking as well just because just the mojo is just not there. It's just everything's just kind of changed up for the team, Mm -hmm. like the way they play and like where everyone's playing and like everyone's responsibilities just like kind of keep up with it and like to keep up these changes. Yeah, no, I I agree. I think that 
you know, you you basically lost like the I would say the anchor of like that made the whole Liverpool team possible was Van Dijk. And when you lost him, it kind of even when you lost him and you still had other players like Gomez and everyone else still healthy, the team was still struggling a little bit. But um yeah, it's just one of those things. It's the hardest thing to do is to defend a title because it's you're already at the mountaintop. How do you motivate yourself even more to get back there again? That's always like one of the hardest things to do. And, you know, that's why it's literally one of the hardest things to do. And that's why it's, it's you know, you kind of uh, you kind of develop um, not entitledness, but it's sort of like it's very hard to motivate yourself again once you reach that mountaintop, I would say. And I think Liverpool are probably just facing a little bit of that withdrawal of it. But you know, as Liverpool go, I think, you know, if they get healthy again next season, I think they're, they're definitely will be a title favorite um, next season when they do have their whole squad avail- available to them. But I wanted to shift the the topic to Everton real quickly. Um, they have beaten Liverpool. They have performed pretty well recently, but I, they do have some weird results. I mean, they lost 2-0 to Fulham, I believe, um, not too long ago, but mm-hmm. I believe they've already caught up with the the amount of games. Um, they've... They're, match like games played i think they're equaled out with everyone else in the league they did basically bl- get blown out by manchester city but um i think uh in terms of like a top four challenge this is the kind of the question where do you kind of see them as a top four contenders i don't know i i i will say i don't think they are good enough to be top four because if i were pitting west ham versus everton i think i'd probably pick west ham over everton right now but I think they're a quality side and I think they have a chance to fight fight for top six. I think they could finish above Arsenal in reality in this season, but I I don't think their squad is quite good enough yet to fight for top four, even with Carlo Ancelotti as their manager, I will say. I agree with you too. I think Everton have a chance for Europa League. Yeah. And I'm not going to lie, at the rate Liverpool are going at right now, it might be them two kind of fighting out for Europa (laughs) League, that last spot, but... I like I've been seeing some promising things though because at a certain point it's not really the question of can Everton do it but it's just like is everyone else around them going to do <laughs> bad enough for Everton to do it to sneak in and, there yeah to sneak in there and right now you have to look at the teams like Aston Villa, Tottenham, Liverpool, Chelsea and you know West Ham and seeing can Everton be better than all of them and right now I feel like the quality of the team Kind of sus at times, kind of sus, but <laughs> the form they're in in certain games, like when Richarlison's fired up, when the core players, Pickford is going off. Oh my gosh, dinosaurs. Dinosaur, and then if Calvert-Lewin can stay healthy, then they, they have a shot. And James Rodriguez, he had a really good start to the season and kind of tailored, like kind of tailed off midway, and then now he's coming back all of a sudden. So, you know, if you can get him going, I really think they have a shot at Europa League, but for... As a Liverpool fan, I really hope they don't. <laughs> I really hope Liverpool kind of turn their way around because I don't mean to turn this back to Liverpool, but I saw Van Dijk. He is starting to eventually come back to training sooner than later of all. Like he's literally a machine. And then Diogo Jota was also spotted back in training too. So yeah, those are big two additions back into the squad that is very much needed. Because after seeing like Minamino score for Southampton twice in like three games, I was just like... <laughs> Could have used that. Could have used him. Yeah, in hindsight, yes. But I, I agree with you. I think um, I think Everton are just a little too far off. Uh, and if they were to qualify for Europe, it would be the first time since I think 2014-15 when they were in Europa League. And that was a while ago. So we'll see what Everton can do. But we wanted to go to the, not the next biggest game, but probably one of the bigger games that just somehow popped up due to the recent form of these two teams is West Ham, Tottenham. West Ham actually beating the Tottenham Hotspur 2-1. Um, they led 2-0 and then Tottenham basically pulled one back with the Lucas Moura goal. But man, Jesse Lingard, I will say as a Manchester United fan, rocking the jersey right here, he is on loan at West Ham and it is so nice. You can talk to any United fan. They are so happy to see him thriving again and seeing him happy scoring goals and dancing and creating a dance club at West Ham. I don't know if you guys saw that celebration with mm-hmm. everyone. He's basically turned them all to dancers, but... It's it's really nice to see Jesse Lingard kind of be happy and seeing him just kind of thrive at a place where um, he can just thrive and just be himself. I think David Moyes has done a good job of just basically letting Lingard do Lingard things. You know, he's nutmegging people. He's running past people. He's scoring bangers. I mean, he's uh, he's having fun. So 
I think it's good for him to be there because I think at Manchester United, I think the pressure was, I would say, mounting. I think um, during these past couple of seasons, there were a lot of personal stuff that happened in his life and he had to kind of, I guess, step up and become more mature. And that probably led into how he was performing on the pitch as well. But at West Ham, I feel like he can kind of just all the expectations are kind of just lifted off his shoulders and he can kind of just play and we're starting to see the best of him. And it's really happy to uh, uh, see him score goals. And he scored the winner over here, scoring, making it two nil. But for me, this kind of leads into the conversation. West Ham are totally top four contenders. I think they are the way their team is formed with like Suchek, Mikel Antonio, Sufal, um, you know, Jesse Lingard is now running, rounding into form. I just like their team and I think they are legitimate top four contenders. They have that David Moyes who uh, for all intents and purposes has done a really good job of getting West Ham back into this, um, into this, uh, I guess this limelight, this spotlight again, because West Ham for past couple of seasons have been kind of the uh, laughing stock. Uh, they kind of been the dormant club of like, why are they always finishing in the bottom half of the table? But now they have finally caught some form. They got rid of the bad players. They, are performing really well. So I think they're totally top four contenders. I like the way the team plays and I, I think they can do it. I think they can definitely shoot for it. I really feel like West Ham is having a lot of fun. Like, yeah. When I mean, you look at the players, when I watch this game with the West Ham players, they just all like they're having just a good time and they're really just playing for each other. And as you said too, a lot of the players that West Ham bought that were bought for you know high potentials that just didn't pan out or just didn't work with the team. They all left in the winter transfer window, and all the players that are still on the team that still have the high potential, like Declan Rice, and you also got Jared Bowen, and now you know Messi Lingard over here just turned back <laughs> up again. Like it's just, and then like Suchek came out of nowhere, dude. It's I, looking like West Ham are doing really well, but the only thing about me that's a little hesitant to say they're top four contenders as much as I want them to be is that the depth of the team is not as strong as say those teams right under them like mm-hmm. Chelsea, Liverpool or even Tottenham at times even though they just beat Tottenham but you know if they lose Lingard if they you know no, knock on wood if they lose Lingard if they lose Jared Bowen like you know these are key players that they don't really have backups for mm-hmm. and you know they could be in a good run of form for now but like if something just if one wheel just falls off it could be a, like the table's so tight right now. They can drop like Liverpool from like first to like six mm-hmm. within a month. Yeah. So I wouldn't be surprised if that could happen too. Because we even saw Aston Villa at a certain point in the season in this top four, top five race too. And then now Aston Villa are in eighth. So I think if I were to make like a wild dark horse winner for the title, I always joked it'd be West Ham because of <laughs> course it'd be the pandemic year where West Ham of all teams wins the title. But uh, if I'm being realistic, I don't think the top four run will end up with them in the top four as much as I want them to be in the Champions League because I think that'd be pretty funny. And I'd rather them than Chelsea. Yeah, that would be just like jokes on jokes. Imagine Chelsea that spent like 220 something million on a whole summer transfer. And then you got West Ham that just loaned in Jesse Lingard or now in the Champions League. But no, I, 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 I'm going to basically, I'm going to say that they can do it. But I think the problem will be is that the teams above them, I think, are just a little bit have just shown a lot more consistency in terms of like not really dropping a ton of points here and there that. I feel like the gap to getting there is going to be the hardest thing because then you're just basically begging that United, Leicester, or Chelsea drop a ton of points. And that's kind of the Mm -hmm. problem West Ham are in right now. But I I think they can go for it. And I think the way they've been playing is great. But the other team in London, Tottenham, have been in an absolute crap form. I know they just beat um, some random team in the Europa League. Deli Ali just scored a bicycle kick. But forget about the Europa League. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about Jose Mourinho being brought in to win trophies. And right now, he's just basically in the same position he was he was in when he was in his first season at Manchester United, which was he's in the Carabao Cup final. He is into the Europa League knockout stages and his side is struggling in the Premier League. Same exact situation in the first season as Manchester United. And my... Knowing how Mourinho is, I know for a fact if he somehow manages to win the Europa League or f- and win the Carabao Cup, he's definitely going to spin it as he's won like the be- like the biggest double of all time. 
Um, he's definitely going to spin it that way. And he won't, he won't basically point to Tottenham's record in the Premier League and what position they are in the table because the form they're in right now, I don't think they can actually go for top four. They're just so, I would say, inconsistent. They're just so bad. And even with Harry Kane back, they still can't find a way to win, pick up wins and, you know, find ways to win games. And it's just, uh, it's just really baffling because as me, it's just really, interesting to see how Mourinho has kind of fallen off with this uh with this team and how the wheels have just kind of fallen off the bus for him because I I just remember in the beginning of the season it looked like Tottenham were the title favorites I mean they blew out Manchester United they were like running away with the title scoring so many goals and then now it's like they're getting the bad version of Mourinho and it's not even a third season yet they're getting him early and it's like I don't know I um I'm just very curious to see how really Tottenham fans view Mourinho at this point because you gave up Pochettino to get him, you know? I I mean, for me, I get the earful from our <laughs> longtime listener, Sung Min, because he's been joking. He's like, I'm about to drop Tottenham as my supporting team and then switching to like Liverpool. I'm no, like, no, don't do, do that. that. And then you since he said that, like Liverpool been sucking. So I'm like, all right, whatever you did, you just cursed both of our teams. I'm like, <laughs> can you support City or something? <laughs> but the way he described it too, he was just like, Tottenham, you know how I describe Liverpool as we're losing beautifully? He's the way Sung Min's described is we're losing ugly. So it's not <laughs> even fun to watch us even play. So right now, Tottenham, I wouldn't be surprised if Jose Mourinho is kind of just thinking in the back of his mind, you know what? If we can win this Carabao Cup and we can win the Europa League, we can get into Champions League that way. And then also spin it as we won a European championship and won a domestic trophy freaking dose right there (laughs) and then on top of that if they somehow miraculously make it to the champions league or into the champions league by winning the europa league and then winning that super cup they'd be like oh we got a trouble (laughs) so you know that's how he is because right now in my opinion they're one of the most underperforming teams in the premier league right now all the firepower they have i know harry kane's been out but i mean you have so many other players on the team and there's just so many questionable plays that I've seen in the lineup, like playing Tanganga this past weekend instead of Daugherty yeah. at right back. I'm like, all right, you got like one of like the best right backs, right wing backs in yeah, the league. Yeah, last season, he was one of the consi- more consistent ones. And you're playing Tanganga, like all all respect, but still, come on. If you wanted to like win against a, like really have your best chance against a West Ham team that is in like the best form of their lives right now, you got to play your best team. And mm-hmm. I don't know. I feel like at certain times, Jose Mourinho doesn't really re- like respect the other team, and that usually causes like certain things like this. But yeah, also, they're it, not in the best form either, so they can't really be taking these risks. I feel like with Mourinho, I feel like with any manager, it's kind of the same. But I feel like with Mourinho, he gets really into his uh, feelings in terms of like he's always trying to prove a point. So it's like it was even this with Manchester United. I remember when Luke Shaw wasn't playing a lot, everyone was like, where's Luke Shaw? Why is he not playing? And then he'll just say, oh, he's not training hard enough. And then we never see Luke Shaw. And then he continues to play like Darmian and Ashley Young as left backs when it's clearly hurting the team that why are we not playing an actual left back? And it's kind of that thing with Mourinho with kind of being, I guess his ego, I feel like gets in the way sometimes of how he should be approaching games because last season, you remember when Ndombele wasn't playing and, everyone kept asking why isn't he not playing and then Mourinho was just like oh he's lazy and he doesn't want to perform but now he spun it like now and Dombele is like one of their best midfielders at the club and I was reading some reports that apparently like their offensive game plan is just to like knock it up to Kane and Son and just pray that they run and find a way to pick out the final pass and like final goal and that's kind of the same way he worked at United but as a Tottenham fan I'm just very concerned that as you said, he's not really maximizing the potential of this squad. And there was reports that apparently he's not too happy with the squad in general, like the resources he has. And in the back of my mind, I was just really curious because I remember at Manchester United when he was a manager, he would always talk about how much he adored this Tottenham side with the players like Deli Ali, Kane, Son, you know, Alderweireld. He would always talk about how great this side was and how structured they were. And now that he's a manager, it's like now he's like, oh, I don't have enough now. So... I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if I really buy that. I think it's kind of like, um, I think it's just one of those things. Mourinho is just not getting enough. He's not getting the most out of his players and the style of play that he plays. I know we've talked about it before. The very defensive counterattacking style doesn't really work all that often now because a lot of teams are playing more progressive front foot forward offensive styles and Mourinho is just not that. 
and I think it's slowly costing his team. And I just don't think he's getting the most out of his players. And I'm just thinking, like, worst case scenario, if you're a Spurs fan, what if you go this whole season and you don't win a trophy? Well, now, <laughs> imagine, like, bringing all this money in to bring Mourinho and you don't get a trophy and now you're in this toxic atmosphere and environment. Now, where do you go? And there's, like, talks about them bringing Julian Nagelsmann in. And a part of me is, like, why would Nagelsmann want to come to Tottenham when he's already at RB Leipzig and they already have a bunch of good youth players there. He's got like his system in place. He's got the resources there. Then if he goes to Tottenham, it's like all of a sudden he's got to rebuild and do everything. He got to build from the ground up type thing. So it's a little worrying that, that I've been hearing reports that like they're trying to replace Mourinho with Julius, N- like Nigelsmann and such. And it's not a good look for Mourinho right now for being a Spurs. If you're a Spurs fan right now. Mm-hmm. How I really kind of pictured it for Tottenham right now too, is just, Mourinho, he had like the right formula. Like at the beginning of the season, everything was clicking, and then all of a sudden it just fell apart. And I don't know. I really don't know. I at this point, you really kind of nailed it. What I was thinking, where it feels like every single player is just being underutilized or not using the most proper way. It's like how I think of Dwell Felix going to Atletico Madrid. He had the option to go anywhere in the world because like he had so many suitors, he had so many options, and then he chose the one team that doesn't play to his advantage. Like that doesn't play to like his style. And I feel like at Tottenham, you know, they weren't, they didn't really get the cha- the opportunity to really decide They're like they just, Jose Mourinho came in after the fact and like, he really kind of played it up as he will make everyone kind of explode, especially like Kane. And at, there was at one point, but then now I don't know if just Jose Mourinho just changed it up completely or it's just, everyone's figured him out. <laughs> but it's just it just feels like everyone's just underutilized or not being used the right way, mm-hmm. and I think that's like the main thing. It's not like a Liverpool situation where it's just there's a bit like you know Liverpool's just a lot of change going on and just kind of coping with what kind of system they already had and just trying to like kind of still make it work and it's just not really working. Whereas M- Mourinho, I don't even know what the system is right now. <laughs> it's just like I just know it's Curse just counter attack. No and then I just know Kane plays really deep. Like, that's about it. And then you just pray Sun gets like a, a wild breakaway goal every once in a while. <laughs> and that's usually how it is. But like, that's literally how I describe it for Tottenham. And that's, I would say, maybe the problem. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like the identity is so, it just, it seems so simple. And then it's just like, it just seems so forced where maybe that's why there's an issue and that's why they're in ninth. But honestly, if this could work, if his big, plan that we're suspecting of him just going all in on these cup competitions just to find success and get trophies honestly if he gets a trophy from this like i still consider that kind of, kind of success <laughs> yeah, especially because for like spurs more who, trophies, have, yeah. who haven't won in a while so it's i guess it's one of those things where it's all relative if they haven't won in a while they'll probably take whatever they can get you know mm-hmm. so and i feel like that's the one similarity between tottenham and liverpool is that maybe the league for this season, it's just it's just out the window. Just focus on competitions that you're just remaining in, and just pray you get far and win. <laughs> hey, so. I mean, that's what Mourinho does. He he's a trophy winner, and he'll find a way to win trophies. So we'll see what happens. Um, but it's definitely not in terms of the Premier League. It's not the it's not looking too good for Mourinho. But we wanted to move it on to I guess quote unquote the biggest game of this past weekend, which is crazy, was Arsenal versus Manchester City, and you probably guessed it. City won. They beat Arsenal 1 0 at the Emirates. It was funny. I think there was a stat. Arsenal, the last time they beat Manchester City was at the Emirates in 2015 or 2014, I think. Um, yeah, 2014 at the at the Etihad. That's the last time they beat our uh beat Manchester City in the Premier League. It's been that long. So Arsenal. Once again, uh, they were just outclassed. The talent was just the talent gap was too much. Um, Man City, I know the scoreline doesn't show up, but they were basically running all over the field with uh, Arsenal here. But one question I wanted to bring up is Arteta the right man for Arsenal? And I was talking to some of my friends that are Arsenal supporters, and they mentioned that there's a yes and no to this. They feel like Arteta at times shows that he is the guy. But there's also times where you can see that he's a very inexperienced manager in the way he handles certain situations with certain players and how they feel like sometimes he kind of picks favorites when it comes to certain players and favors certain players over others. 
And there's also the aspect of he is very young, but he doesn't have the resources and the talent there to kind of challenge for more uh, and the resources there. Because if you look at the Arsenal squad, it's very, very young and very raw. And there's a, a lot of players still there that are not very good, such as David Luiz, Willian, um, and those other factors. So they basically said they want to give him more time because they said it's a little too early to basically call it quits on Arteta because of the situation around him. But they do acknowledge the fact that there's a lot of dead wood and a lot of uh, kind of garbage, I would say. A lot of players they need to clear out. And yeah, and I think it's just one of those situations where it's just Arteta's kind of in this weird phase where you can kind of see where he's trying to go, but he just doesn't have the talent to kind of take it there. Sort of like Solskjaer last season when he didn't have basically missing piece was Bruno to help him elevate the team. Arsenal kind of missing that Bruno player where they need him to elevate the team. So it's kind of a yes and no to it. It was a lot to ask Odegaard to be that kind of Bruno player. <laughs> <laughs> like it was surprising to see Bru- or Odegaard get the start because it was, a, it was a tall order just to go straight into this game after only being with the squad for like a little over a month yeah, and then being like, all right, you're the man for against Man City instead of like, you know, Smith Rowe or just any other player who's, you know, Smith Rowe's been like, kind of been in form and, you know, he's been a part of the squad for a while. Mm-hmm. So I think like certain things like that, like Arteta might not have the experience to really kind of identify, you know, very specific cases for what tactically to do. Although he's facing like probably one of the most, like the hardest tacticians to you know break down in the world with Pep Guardiola, and he worked under him. It, you know, it's I can't really blame him, but at the same time, like Odegaard was like not even mentioned for like the first thirty minutes. Yeah, I feel like during that game, I was just like, "Where is he at?" <laughs> so, I mean, and then City, they, you know, I feel like City, although they won one nil, they dominated, and there was still concern that they're only just winning one nil. So I still have to give some credit Arsenal because despite everything that happened and the the fact that City seemed really dominant, the fact that they only kept it to one zero was pretty big actually because <laughs> like for most of the game, if you're a City fan, I'd be sweating because like any random goal, any kind of breakaway could it could just tie up the game or and then after that some momentum just pushes it to two one and it could be like that. But Man mm-hmm. City they they were very headstrong and just kept yeah, what they they've got, been doing. They this got De Bruyne past. back. They got De Bruyne back, who wasn't really that in form. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> it's very much like, it. yeah, that's your, yeah. It's kind of one of those scare factors. Like, holy crap, like one of the best midfielders in the world is back. And Aguero and was on the, the bench. Their bench is literally like a top four team once again. <laughs> but I feel, I feel like even that's the scariest part too. Like Man City were not firing in all cylinders, yet they were still able to get a 1-0 win mm-hmm. quite comfortably against Arsenal. Yeah, they scored within the first 90 seconds, I think, or the first two minutes. Sterling had her um, mental stuff. <laughs> it, and it, it, and I, I will say after the game, there was a bit of a controversy right here um, with David Luiz apparently laughing, talking with the City players after the whistle was blown. And I know Tim Howard um, kind of spoke about this and he said that if David Luiz was his teammate and he saw him doing that after they had lost to one of the best teams in England, he would be really upset um, because when he was basically saying that when you lose like that, your thing, your, your, the thing you should be doing is you should be once you, you know, kind of make the handshakes and, you know, kind of do like the uh, courteous thing there. You get back into the locker room, you hear your coach give the speech um, about what to do, you know, and you talk to your teammates. But David Luiz was just sitting here like joking around, laughing around. And Tim Howard was basically very blunt about it. He just shows that he doesn't care, that David Luiz does not care about uh, playing for the club, playing for Arsenal. And I think Arsenal have done a good job recently of getting rid of those players. But I still think there's just like that one last turnover of players that they need to kind of get rid of. And I think once they do, I think then Arteta and Arsenal can really start building for the future. Because as a Manchester United fan that has that has seen firsthand what toxic players like that can do to a club, it's very important that you get them out and you just rebuild from there. And it's just important that they get the players that want to be here for the long term and not players that just want to come here for a paycheck. And I still think with Arsenal, players like David Luiz, Willian, um, they still have certain players there that are kind of just at Arsenal for a paycheck and not really playing for the badge or playing for the club and playing for the history. And I think when you have that, it's not very good. 
as a Manchester United fan, I saw too many players like that. So um, Arsenal kind of need to get that one last turnover. And I think then we can finally maybe start seeing some maybe um, some more uh, positive things from the club, I would say. I, I agree with that statement too, because that's always been like a be like overlooming thing that I've been hearing the past couple of years. It's like, oh man, this guy doesn't play for the badge. It's like <laughs> the only real captain is like Kieran Tierney. Like all those kind of statements where it's like, oh man, I wish, you know, Arteta started this player. It's like, that's the player who really cares. So <laughs> like just those little statements, it's just are kind of not even low key big. It's just one of those things I've been seeing other teams do pretty well more recently. Like, you know, it's Man United was one of the more recent ones. And, you know, Arsenal are really close. And that to like clearing house and getting rid of those, like, you know, Deadwood, like David Luiz, <laughs> Willie, like, I don't even know why they're there. <laughs> like they literally got them like last minute too. It's just like they're very much like yeah, last minute kind of players that they got onto the team. But for the whole David Luiz thing, not really caring and kind of laughing, talking to city players after the pitch, I I kind of agree with Tim as well. Where if you were really caring for the team, you would be upset that you yeah. guys lost. <laughs> You'd be upset. Like you wouldn't want to talk to anyone. It's like don't talk to me. I'm going to the locker room. I'm going to see what's up. Like and you can you know you can always talk to people after the game like mm-hmm. you're not leaving immediately, <laughs> so you know you kind of get sorted out in the locker room, get everything sorted, and then after the game's done, you know you can talk to you know your your buddies on another team or things like that, but not immediately right after when you've been when your whole team has been going ham for like ninety minutes, you got stuff done like the last ten minutes, but then it's like <laughs> yeah, wasn't me like we kept a clean sheet for the ten minutes I was on so. <laughs> Oh man, and, and plus, like he's one of the players that's been notorious for getting like some of the red cards at Arsenal when he has started games and such. So it's 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 just not been a good look, I would say, for um, some of these Arsenal players. But yeah, I, I lulls. yeah, I literally agree with you. Yeah, David Luiz is just like the walking meme at this point. We meme factory. Mm-hmm. Um, but what what else what else could you say here? It's just that Arsenal, I think, just have that little less. They just have a little bit more time left before they can actually start making judgments on Arteta. And for City, they won today in the Champions League, so they have now won nineteen. They've won nineteen straight games, which is insane across all competitions. Which is come on, why are they playing career mode on like easy at this point or <laughs> semi pro? Um, it's not fair, and it's uh, yeah, it's just not fair. It's one of those things. City are just dominating right now, but. I wanted to uh, switch the topics to the other team in Manchester, Manchester United hosting Newcastle. 3-1 win for United. Um, not the most comfortable. I mean, at this point, United don't make anything comfortable this season. It's always just kind of like, oh, what's going to happen here? But Dan James scored. Dan James has been picking up some form lately. I'm actually quite pleasantly surprised. He's been keeping Mason Greenwood out of the lineup. He's been keeping Ahmad Diallo out of the lineup. Dan James, the young Welshman, has been... Uh, Lighting it up recently, so I'm happy for him because um, I think uh, I think he's slowly improving a little bit um, in terms of his finishing. He's still not there completely, but in terms of last season, he's definitely gotten a lot better and a lot more comfortable um, shooting and just being a little bit more confident. But my biggest topic is that they still need a center back. Center, they need a new center back badly. But Martial has been a topic of conversation that has been looming over United fans, I guess, and the general Premier League. Um, just his status as the number nine, the main number nine at the club. And unfortunately, I know last season it was looking like he was starting to make strides towards becoming that main number nine, the main goal scorer, the guy that you could consistently rely on to score 20 goals. But this season, whether that's down to COVID and the truncated season, that probably has all a play a part to it. But Martial just really has not looked like the player he was last season. It looks like he's just kind of missing a step. And for me, It's just one of those things where maybe it's starting to look more likely that he's not going to be the main number nine at United, which is unfortunate because he came in with tons of potential from Monaco. And it it just looks like one of those things where United kind of need to look elsewhere in the transfer market to find a the main number nine. Obviously, they have Cavani, but Cavani, as you know, is aging. You can't rely on him to be main number nine all the time. But um, it's sad. I, I really wish Martial would work out. I mean, he's still got some time, but I think Solskjaer, Solskjaer is low-key one of those coaches that's, he doesn't outwardly say, like call people out, but he's very quick to make judgments inside the club and basically not throw people under the bus, but make quick decisions. And, you know, I guess state decisions that are not very 
easy to make, he'll make them, like such as selling Lukaku and other things like that. He can make those decisions. And I think Solskjaer probably knows that. Martial, unfortunately, as much as it hurts me, will probably not be the main number nine for United um, any longer, I will say, because uh, he just has not performed when he has had the number nine spot. And it's, uh, it's a little frustrating as a United fan. I've been kind of seeing that too, just even as a non-United fan, just <laughs> watching, it's like, Geez, this Martial guy, he bursted onto the scene against Liverpool. I remember when he first debuted and then scored the game winner. And I was just kind of sad. But right now, he hasn't really gotten that much farther since his debut, I feel like, over time. Like, he's gotten better, but not to the potential where... Yeah, he's supposed to be he Mbappe to before be. Mbappe. Exactly. Like, it was literally him and Mbappe both at Monaco. And then it's like, dang. Martial is up there. I wonder if Mbappe can be like the next Martial. And it's like, psych, Mbappe's the actual good player. <laughs> yeah. So I really think at a certain point too, Martial is maybe just not filling into the system. Like right now, Bruno Fernandes is the main guy. And I feel like the striker up top needs to be someone who can help assist Bruno Fernandes. Almost like a second Bruno Fernandes at times. Because I don't <laughs> even know if a target man will really help. You yeah. see Cavani as the target man right now. Granted, he's not in like prime form, but he's still Cavani. He's still, if he needs to be the target man, you don't really have to be that agile. You don't really have to be, you know, the speedy guy like Dan James. You just have to be in the right spot. Mm -hmm. And even with Cavani usually in the right spots and usually can finish most opportunities given to him, it's not really even like the best kind of striker to have paired up in front of Bruno Fernandes either. So maybe just having someone... Who and then like Martial is more like a speed guy too, so it's not it's not speed, it's not the target man. Like what is it? So I'm guessing it's probably more like just a second kind of Bruno Fernandez, like yeah. like a Firmino kind of like player where they can just feed the wings or just feed Bruno, and then occasionally if they get set up for a chance, they can at least finish that. So yeah. I really think maybe that's what United need, but that's such a rare thing, and also they're stuck with what they got right now. You can't just yeah. say like, all right, Martial, you're out. Or yeah. like, no, Cavani is a good run. Like they, they're stuck with them the rest of the season. Yeah. But at least right now, they're starting to see what they could really need to fit into the team. Because obviously, if you put Bruno Fernandez as striker, which I did in career mode at one point, <laughs> uh, like it kind of works. But I still feel like he's better if he's not like the main man up top. Yeah. Like if you put him in the center of everything, then he can be the star that he is. Just literally getting a goal chance, whether it be a goal or an assist, or some like a big chance on mm -hmm. goal every single game just because of where he is and just making sure he can continue doing that is the is like the key thing yeah so maybe even like a Giroud because like Giroud is like man someone who usually underrated helps. underrated yeah, he's very underrated <laughs> see him bicycle kick oh my in gosh Champions League? man he scored a, <laughs> he scored a Puskas for a scorpion kick and he probably win a, he'll probably win a Puskas or be in the contention for for a bicycle kick I mean this guy just only scores some of the most incredible goals out there um God. In my uh, like 10 second Jeru tangent, you can literally make a compilation of just all of his goals and then like trick people into thinking he's like one of the best players of all time. <laughs> like he just all the goals he scores and all the ch like chances he's created. Like literally my favorite goal of all time is still that Arsenal goal against Norwich with Jack Wilshere getting that oh, final touch. Yeah. You know who gave him the ball? Jeru. Freaking Jeru. <laughs> so, you, know, you know, it's funny. People remember those goals, but I don't know if you remember that Champions League match against Monaco at the Emirates when he missed like like so many sitters, like just like straight up open goals. Like this not is open why goals, he's not the best player of all yeah. time. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just like, I think it will be funny because I think we'll always remember him for like his great goals, but we'll also forget like, I mean, he was like a main reason they won the World Cup too. Like he held up the mm -hmm. ball with Griezmann and then Mbappe, like even the Euros, like there was a reason he was starting over some of the other French strikers like that they, that they could have disposed out there. So um, that, yeah, that was kind of a weird like Frenchman Olivier Giroud tangent but I mean it's true and I think for United I guess going back to them I would love to see if they could somehow find a way to maybe play Mason Greenwood as a striker because he's supposed to be Ooh. his main role is actually a striker it's not he's he can play right wing but his most comfortable role is a striker because he uh, has those uh basically those um those tendencies of like he he can he has like he's strong on both feet he doesn't really have a weak foot i would say um so i would love to see him get some games as like a striker but i don't know if that would be the belt wisest decision because if you do that then you kind of rupture the chemistry with marcial the marcial's gonna be like why are you starting like a, a 19 year old a striker when you got me so 
it's one of those tricky things. And luckily for United, Solskjaer was a former striker himself. So is there anybody that can get a striker in form? Was probably it's probably going to be Solskjaer. So um, I, I just want to see. Hopefully, if Marcio can kick on. But as I said before, it's looking more and more likely that they'll probably have to get a striker sooner than later, which is unfortunate. I would say. Because I used to have Lukaku, and I freaking love Lukaku. I wish he, I wish he worked out at United, man. He's tearing it up at Syria right now. I, I still feel like right now, after hearing that Greenwood explanation, it's like, oh yeah, they do have them. No, <laughs> I would start Greenwood. They already have a striker. You guys mm-hmm. are good. He like, has like that tendency. Like he has, he reminds me of Timo Puki, that <laughs> Greenwood boy. Literally, he is two footed. He has that instinct to just rip a shot from anywhere. Like. That's what you really need, and just put he, someone else at right wing. He, um, his like favorite move is like the stepovers, and like there was an interview he got. He basically learned the stepover move, or got the inspiration for it. Was watching the original Ronaldo R nine, uh, watching clips of him where he would just do like the stepovers on repeat. So, um, he's got kind of like that, uh, that little young flair to him. But no, he's a he's a great player, and I think um, I would love to see him start playing more in his most comfortable striking position rather than kind of being played out in the right wing because a lot of times he's kind of affecting the right wing, but he's not the most effective because his natural tendency is not to cross balls. It's to like cut inside and try to shoot. But we already mm-hmm. have that with Marcus Rashford. So it's like you have two wingers that kind of do the same thing and it's it kind of becomes a little predictable at the end of the day when you have two people that kind of do the same thing, I would say. Yeah, so... We'll we'll see how that kind of goes for the rest of the season because yeah. like you kind of stuck with it, but for next yeah. season, you got our two cents. Yeah, <laughs> menu. <laughs> but um, Newcastle, I know we were we want to mention them with the relegation battle because I guess we're switching over to the relegation battle here. Fulham have been on a tear recently and are only three points away from tying, well, being on level with points with uh, Newcastle, and I believe they have a better goal differential. Um, last time I checked, mm-hmm. but yep. Fulham have been. Tearing it up, they're starting to turn some of their those draws. Like they they've drawn the most amount of games in the league, I believe, and they're starting to turn some of them into wins. And Scott Parker's got them playing some good stuff. They have the legend um, Josh Maja on the side. They have uh, who's the other the other Lookman. yeah Lookman going ham. He's literally going ham. They they're just playing some good stuff. Um, and Fulham Scott Parker's got Fulham um, in hot form right now, and Steve Bruce has been getting um, Newcastle in some absolutely trouble right now. They are in absolutely big trouble. They're out of confidence. Miguel Amiron looks a little confident, but you can't really rely on Miguel Amiron to carry your entire team. I know St. Maximin scored the goal, but he couldn't really do it all. The team is in shambles, I would say. And if I'm a Newcastle fan, I would be very, very ashamed of this club right now because you are Newcastle United, one of the biggest clubs of England, I would say, way back in like the 90s. And I would say in the 2000s as well, you have one of the greatest strikers of all time in the Premier League era play for your club, Alan Scherer. You have so many past legends that have played for Newcastle United. You have some of the good managers that have been there. And they had a great one in Rafa Benitez. And then the owner got in the way wouldn't give them the money, wouldn't give them the resources, and now look where they're at. And gosh, I just feel so sorry for Newcastle fans because at the rate they're going, I would back Fulham to stay up in the Premier League than Newcastle because it's just a sad scene at Newcastle, man. Oh, the, the club with so much potential, St. James's Park, the Toon Army, and now they're like fighting to stay in the Premier League. Oh, you just hate to see it. Man, you're making me... You're like tricking me into thinking you're a Newcastle fan right there. That was very emotional. But I feel like every Newcastle fan is saying the same thing too. It's just, it feels bad. Even as like a Liverpool fan, seeing Newcastle like this. Usually when I play career mode, I use Newcastle just because it's just like a team that has so much of potential, as you said. Like the stadium's insane. The fan base is insane. And if they just had the right players and like the right, you know, spending, they could be big again. They literally had like a Champions League manager, Rafa Benitez. How do you not? That 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 to me baffles me. Benitez stuck with them in the championship to get them out and go into the Premier League, and then they just they just did them dirty. Mike Ashley just did them dirty, man. And it's it's rough because they have cornerstone players that want to stay. Like like headband Saint Maxim wants to stay at the team. He had that like six year contract. It's crazy. <laughs> and he wants to stay. He wants the team to do well, but the team itself is just stuck in this mindset of like we're just a 
we're just here to get by you know we're just here this is the team we're at like we're, we have the ambition of a team that's just getting the bare minimum <laughs> so i think that's the issue too it's just you have just different mindset of players and like those contrasting bits are just clashing all the time and that's what's causing newcastle to be almost in a free fall at this point because mm-hmm. You know, Fulham on the opposite side, they have such passion from their manager. Like when when you saw Fulham get that three points this last weekend, like Scott Parker was like screaming. Like it wasn't like Hassan Hoodle crying on the floor, but like <laughs> Scott Parker was just so ecstatic that you can see just see their emotion. You can see just the pure joy that there's a chance now. There's hope for Fulham. Yeah. But for Newcastle, it's just always gray. It's just like Seattle in like the winter. It's just literally <laughs> There's there's no hope. It's just we're here. If we can get a point, if we can get a win, oh that was a lucky day. But if we get a get a loss, it's just whatever. <laughs> it's just it is what it is. That's literally the epitome of Newcastle. It's just it is what it is. And I'm on your train, Yosh, where Fulham, they have all opportunity to catch up because Josh Maja, the documentary star, has <laughs> been kind of in form yeah. in this past few games that he started. And that's all you really need. If you can get him just to score a goal here or there, and then Ariola just on top of his head once again, just mm-hmm. keeping those clean sheets in the back. I mean, that's all you really need. And then if you can just scrape away a few points here and there, and then you get the 40, you're set. Yeah. And Newcastle, meanwhile, just not doing it. Like Almiron. Callum Maxim, Wilson's been like a huge miss because he's since he's been out injured, they just haven't been able to score goals consistently. And um, but yeah, that's been the main problem since Callum Wilson has been gone, which is scoring goals. And it's unfortunate that he's gone, but also you can't be that reliant on one player when you got like all these other good players around Callum mm-hmm. Wilson. It's literally, it's kind of like the opposite situation with like West Ham where I'm thinking it's like, well, if they lose a player here and there, there goes like their top four chances. But for Newcastle, it's like they lose like St. Maxim or they lose like Almiron. They're getting relegated. Yeah. Like they're straight up like there's key players on this team that are the only ones that look like they really care. Or like they look like they're actually quality Premier League players that if they're gone, yeah, they're they're, they're toast. toast. Like yeah. Fulham <laughs> have the opportunity now to just leapfrog. When at one point we we're thinking Fulham, we're toast. They're basically toast, and then now all of a sudden, Josh Maja Magic literally just ascending them from the grave, and they're making a freaking Nigel Pearson level comeback out <laughs> the of the relegation escape. zone. I will say, all right, I guess I'll put this question: um, Who do you think stays up? Out of the two clubs, I'm going to back Fulham. Who are you backing? As of right now, I I really want Fulham just because of Josh Maja. And just <laughs> like, Adama Lookman looks like he's on a mission, despite him kind of soiling it at one part of the season when he did a Penenka for a penalty. That, that Wasn't that... Oh, wait. Actually, funny enough, wasn't it um, Kennedy when he played for Newcastle? He tried to do like a Rabona goal when they were in relegation battle or something like that. I'd be surprised, but... I don't remember, but I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> I swear it was something he did something very this was back when Kennedy was still at Newcastle. He did something really ridiculous. I'm like, what are we what are we doing here? Why is he trying this when they're losing? Because um, they don't care. Yeah. Like, man. The culture of the club at this point, brought down by the owner. Um so I know I know this isn't on our rundown, but I wanted to quickly mention with Crystal Palace, Christian Benteke scored, I would say. Would you say Screamer or up there as one of the screaming goals of the uh, Premier League season? Basically took a volley at the last kick of the game on his right foot and struck it so cleanly to the backside of the net and it hit the corner of the net and won the game for Crystal Palace and like the most ultimate smash and grab. Um, and my gosh, and it just brought me back because I was like, when I think of Ben Teke, I think of that goal, but I also think of the bicycle kick he hit against Manchester United before Marcial's goal. <laughs> and I'm just like, how does this guy that misses like some of the most easiest chances score some of the most best and most memorable Premier League goals of all time? I don't get it. He's literally the epitome of like the rec league guy who just <laughs> starts every game and scores two goals the whole season, but they're both bangers. <laughs> okay. Like he used to be like the the carry for Aston Villa, but now gosh, after, I remember those days. After Liverpool has just been kind of downhill Jones, but Somehow he's still getting the check at Crystal Palace, getting that starting role every single game. And this is that one magic goal of the season. So you got to you gotta milk that. <laughs> it's funny. But, 
leading up to that goal, I, I don't know if you saw his touch, but his touch was like so bad, <laughs> like leading up to the goal. But it's somehow ricocheted into a Crystal Palace player that he just like scores that banger from that volley. I, I don't, I don't get it. I really don't get it. It's all part of the plan, man. <laughs> He's playing his own IQ. Oh my gosh! I think that Benteke goal. It wasn't a spectacular goal that you typically see. It wasn't like an upper ninety. It wasn't like a bike. It was just the most precisioned <laughs> and like calculated placed volley, where it's like he was only able to put it if on this particular trajectory to score. And it just had to be like this, the right speed, the white bend, the right hit, the right timing, like everything just had to be right. And he actually did it and then won them the game in such a crucial game. So that's why it's so big. It's kind of like Luka Doncic. Yeah, game winner. Game winner. <laughs> <laughs> With 0-1 seconds left on the clock against the Celtics recently. Yeah. It's all in like an MVP moment, except... This is like the only thing he's done all season. <laughs> <laughs> um, man, I, I just had to bring that up because I think uh, when Benteke does something like that, it's definitely worth bringing up. I remember back in the day when um, him and Lukaku were like, oh, this is the future of Belgium right here. Benteke and <laughs> Lukaku as the strikers. Obviously, Lukaku, as we know, is a way better striker than Benteke. But my goodness, we had to applaud that strike uh, when we saw that. That was definitely worthy of being mentioned on the premiere pod so congrats on Ben Teki on that one but we wanted to move it on to the preview section I know we're getting pretty long here but um, we got some pretty big games this weekend so it started off we got Manchester City versus West Ham United a big game right here basically top of the table West Ham gunning for top four City looking to basically run away with the title as they are right now at the Etihad I I'm going to go with Jesse Lingard, Manchester United vibes. Going to go for the revenge factor there. So I'm going to go West Ham picking up a surprise 2-1 win against the machine that is the Manchester City. Just because I want to see City lose at this point out of spite. <laughs> for me, I I don't know if anyone, anyone's been keeping track of our records for the preview section. It's probably pretty uh, atrocious at this point. For me, I I think I haven't gotten one right for like three weeks straight. And like we do three a week. So and like it's not even like I'm off by like a goal or two. It's like straight up. It's like, oh, the other team won or something like that. So I've been just like way off. But for this one, I'm going to be opposite of you, Yosh. I'm just going to play it safe. I'm going to say who've been on fire in defense. It's like what happens when like an impenetrable force get based off of like the sharpest knife. I don't know if that's the right analogy. Probably not. But <laughs> I think City, that defense is just too strong, especially if it's the usual suspects of... Diaz, Stones. Diaz, Stones. I guess Zinchenko. Cancelo. Cancelo. Yeah. Like the usual th- four. And then Ederson, so for some reason, is now the best Brazilian keeper in the world. I think that defense is just too strong. And like, you know, Pep Guardiola, he doesn't really F about. So I think a 2-0... Is what I'm seeing. Okay. All right. He's going 2-0 City. I'm going 2-0. Uh, 2-1 West Ham for the win. Then we got Leicester City Arsenal, which is not even the biggest game of the weekend, which is crazy. We got a really good slate of games this weekend. But this game, Leicester are gunning for top four. They're in really good form. Um, I think the biggest question is if Brandon Rodgers could keep the Leicester side performing at a consistent level for the rest of the season and not tailor off like they did last season. And Arsenal... They need some confidence badly because they got blown out by City in a, in, a, in a sense, but they have not been in really good form in the Premier League, I would say. And uh, I don't know. Unfortunately for Arsenal fans, I'm sorry. I think Leicester continue to roll. I think they pick up a, a 2-1 win on this one. Uh, actually, I want to go 3-1. I think Leicester do pick up a 3-1 win against Arsenal. I, just, I, I can't see Arsenal winning this game. Ooh. They were at the King Power. I really don't know if home field advantage at this point really says anything. <laughs> yeah, I will like, say oh, I, I, I will say Harvey Barnes and James Madison have been ripping it up for Leicester. They have been tearing it up, like Harvey Barnes especially. Yeah, like he's making me from two years ago sound smart. I know but, we mentioned that we were like, dude, this Harvey Barnes cat seems like he's a good. Yeah, you can actually go back to season one. We'll mention Harvey Barnes in one of these episodes. Uh, we were like, yeah, this dude is like a once to watch. If you were to give him a once to watch card in FIFA, he would be the one. To watch back in like FIFA 19, except Harvey that was Barnes. a long time ago. It was when <laughs> I was still a wee boy in college, but now I'm a disheveled old man. <laughs> but for me, I I think Arsenal really have a big part, kind of some 
confidence knowing that although they lost to City, it was only a 1-0. And Leicester, they've been surprising this season in the fact that they haven't fallen apart yet at the second half, at least in my opinion, under Brandon Rodgers. So I actually think it'll be a lot closer. I think despite Harvey Barnes going off, James Madison going off, Jimmy Vardy is coming back from injury more recently. I think if Arsenal don't make any mistakes, which they <laughs> sometimes are prone to, then Arsenal can get the 1-1 draw. Oh, but okay. Any mistakes they make, it'll be a 2-1 or a 3-1 or a 4-1. <laughs> okay. But I'm, I'm going to be confident and say Arsenal don't make any mistakes, which is very rare, but just to change it up too, I'm going to say 1-1. Okay, you I, won. I two, two. Two, two. Okay, oh, a high scoring affair right there. Okay, I'm going 3 1 Leicester. He's going 2 2 for the draw. And then finally, we got the biggest match of the weekend Chelsea versus United. Chelsea under Tuco have been really, really good. United have picked up some form of late after stumbling a little bit. This one will be interesting because I think United have still to play their Europa League match, which is tomorrow, but they did pick up a 4-0 win in the first leg. So I don't think Solskjaer is going to play his strongest side. So that at least allows the players to pick up some rest going into this big matchup. And it really is a big matchup because I think if United lose, Chelsea could go into basically two points off of United's place right now. And United want to basically be in a position where they kind of com- comfortably can claim top four. And you know I'm always going to back United. And I actually feel like they could win this game because even though Tuchel is a very tactician, a very tactical mind, he's going to get his side set up technically to kind of stop United in a sense. I feel like there's a... United have still yet to pick up a win against one of the big six opponents. Um, and I think that will happen this week at Stamford Bridge. So I'm going to go with United winning a um, pretty reasonable scoreline. I would say 2-1. I, I don't think United could keep a clean sheet unfortunately, but I'm going to go for 2-1 Manchester United picking up the victory. Mm. There's this one tweet that just really resonates with me that I saw um, this past week. And it was, I don't get why people are City fans. It must be so boring because as a Man United fan, you don't know in any game you go into whether you're going to win 4-2 or 4-0 or you're going to lose 3-2. I think that's the epitome of Man U right now. It's like, as you said, it's very much like that Liverpool side from 2013-14. And Chelsea have conceded very little goals under Tuchel. Like, it's basically like you can count just like two. And one of them was an own goal. So, for United to even score two and like match that, that'd be a tall order. And I feel like they have the right player to do that, though, is Bruno Fernandes. Bruno Fernandes, the man... That being said, Chelsea managed to stop a Diego Simeone Atletico Madrid that was at the top, that's still at the top of the La Liga table this past week in the mm-hmm. Champions League. And Giroud scored that bicycle kick. Yeah, Atleti was playing like 6-6-2 formation, something like that. And that's not what Man is going to be doing. They're going <laughs> to, if anything, it'll be like a negative one <laughs> when you put all the players together. But I think it'll be a very attacking game for Man U. And I think Chelsea, they're going to try to counter playing that Alonso wing position that just always somehow works whenever he plays. But I think this is going to be a very open game. I think it'll be very open despite um, the historical score lines I usually try to say for big games of the nil nails. But ever since I've been saying those, they've not been nil nil. So I, I don't know if I'm jinxing it now, but I think it'll be a pretty good game to watch. I think it'll be. I'll back. I'll back you. Yes. yes. I will back United to win just because I don't want Chelsea getting any more points. Let's I'm gonna go. say actually two one as well. Okay. You know what? No. No. I'll okay. say two zero. Oh wow! You keep it. You think we're, you have enough confidence for us to keep a clean sheet? That's a. Uh, that's nice of you. That's nice of you to say. But I'm going two one. He's going two no. That is a. Uh, uh, that is a good result. I'm really hoping they actually turn in turn turn that basically that result comes true because they're most likely going to play Mick Fred in the midfield, which is if you didn't know McTominay Mick Fred. And, and Fred and um yeah I don't know I'm hoping I'm hoping United can pick up a win. I'm really looking forward to this game, but we'll see what happens. But that basically wraps up episode 107 for us. As we always say, um, please give us give this podcast a like um, and leave us a rating on Apple Podcasts if. If you can, if you don't want to, that's totally fine. We do appreciate you just taking the time to listen. But if you also want to just share this podcast to one of your friends, that'd be great too if they love um, anything to do with Premier League soccer or soccer in general. 
that would be great. And we also have a YouTube channel at the Premier Pod that you can subscribe and like our videos if you want to catch the video version of the podcast is there. And you can also follow us at the Premier Pod on Instagram and Twitter. Please leave us any messages you have there. We'll definitely reply to them on there as well. But yeah, that kind of wraps up um, Season 3, Episode 107 for us. Thank you guys so much for listening. We appreciate it. Peace. Peace.